Well, good morning again to all of you this morning. We are still continuing the true north, right? The true north of where we're headed. We're all walking in this life, but we all have to be headed in one direction. And Paul writes in Ephesians that we are one faith. We are one baptism. We are one Lord. We are united. So if we're united, we all have to be walking kind of in the same direction. All right? I mean, that's kind of common sense. So what is that? We've deci- we have defined the gospel as our true north. Last week, we looked at how God is constantly moving around us, even when we don't necessarily feel it, even when we necessarily don't see it. And we also looked how he is faithful to his people and he is faithful to his design, his design for you to be free. But as we think about it, right, we are in a world that is constantly moving. We are in a fast-paced culture. We always have something else to do, and we're constantly moving around. And if you even notice, just in life itself, as we constantly move around, it's very easy for us to miss obvious things. Would would you understand that? Does that make sense? We're so busy. We have so much moving around, so much going on around us, so much information now that maybe we haven't had before that we just kind of miss obvious situations. We miss maybe being intentional with our spouse. We miss maybe being intentional and spending time with our kids. Maybe we just forget to go to the grocery store. We just forget that we were supposed to cut the oven off. You know, just types of things like that. Because we're in a constantly moving world, constantly moving life that is just insanely busy. Uh, That's why it's crucial that we focus on the gospel. We stay unified around this idea. But as we're in this constantly moving culture, what if there are some things that we miss on a spiritual level? What if there are some things that we just bypass in a spiritual sense every day? The psalmist writes in in Psalm 119.11 that I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's the reason we spend time in the word. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, Joshua says, right before end of the conquest, right? We looked at Joshua chapter 5 last week. But this is what Joshua says. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. For you to have good success, you must first sit in the Word. You must first understand God's words to you. Meditate on it day in, day out, night and day. Paul says pray without ceasing. This idea is that we are in constant communication and constantly aware of the spiritual realm and spiritual environment around us. I love 1 Peter chapter 5, and this is kind of the diving board into Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 is where we're going to be at today if you want to go ahead and turn that direction. But 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8 is kind of where we're going to dive off into this today. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That idea, that concept, that sober-minded literally means to be aware. Uh, Just aware conceptually. We think of it kind of in a drinking alcohol sense, and maybe so, right? If you're intoxicated or you've had a little bit too much to drink, it's really hard for you to be aware, isn't it? So you're being aware. You're being sober-minded. You're being open and aware of what's going on around you. I served in Thailand a couple of years ago. I went for the summer and did serve through Nehemiah teams. And before I left, I got shipped off to the middle of Timbuktu, Alabama for training. I'm talking about you go straight past the middle of nowhere to nowhere is where I was. Uh, You feel me? That's where I was at. And during this week, before I got, before we got on a plane, and actually went. I went through extensive training. It was uh, active shooter drills. It was bomb drills. It was all of this stuff because, unfortunately, that's the world that we live in now. And some of the places that we were serving were those areas. It was areas where we had to be aware if we wanted to come back home alive. Uh, thank God that you know that wasn't necessarily where I was going, but we had some teams going in those places. And so those were some things that we really needed to be aware of that. And And ever since I had that training, I want to see the door. I want to know what's going on around me. I want to, when something happens, what's what's going on. It it has heightened my sense of awareness because I was ignorant before. I didn't know what I needed to be aware of. I wasn't sure what I needed to be looking for. But now that I've been through it over and over again, it got drilled into me that you are dead now because you didn't pay attention. This is the same concept spiritually. If we are not careful, your adversary, the devil, seeks to not just pester you. We looked at it already a little bit before we came on board and started this series together. Uh, He seeks to destroy you. 
He doesn't seek to get on your nerves. He seeks to completely ruin you and ruin your ministry and ruin who you are. So if we're going to walk this walk, if we're going to walk this unifying walk in true north, what do we need to be aware of? How can we be sober-minded, spiritually aware in a world that is constantly moving? Let's pray together and we'll dive in. God, you are so good. And we just declare that in this house that you are good. And your goodness is enough. God, I just pray in this moment that, God, your word would be sharper than the two-edged sword, God, piercing even to the joints and the marrow of our souls. God, I pray that if you can use me in the declaration of your word, then, God, please do. But, God, get me out of the way that we may see you in the fullness of your glory. God, more than a good time this morning, God, more than church, God, more than anything else, God, we need you in this house. God, help us to be aware. God, awaken our hearts, awaken our souls to the world that is constantly moving around us. And it's in your name alone, God, we pray. I love you. Amen. Acts chapter 3 is where we are. Now, the reason we didn't read it is because we're going to track through the entire chapter of Acts chapter 3. So just for time's sake, I didn't ask you to stand and we do all that stuff. But let's just dive in verse 1. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. So let's backtrack. What do we know? Peter and John are on their way to the temple in the afternoon, at the ninth hour, around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We know, based on the book of Daniel and some of the things that we see transpire in the Old Testament, that it was Jewish custom, one of the pillars was for them to pray three times a day. Was for them to pray morning, was for them to pray noon, was to pray for them afternoon, was to pray mid-afternoon. So, at the ninth hour, now again, you've got to remember, Peter and John have already experienced Jesus, right? They've already been around Jesus. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus has ascended into heaven and has left his disciples with this commandment and this mandate. You will be my witnesses. Once the Holy Spirit comes, you will be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem, and then to the ends of the world. So this is after Jesus has ascended and beginning the time that we now live in now as we eagerly await Jesus' return. So Peter and John still are in this concept of, hey, I need to go to the temple and pray because they are still practicing some of those things that they grew up with. Not because they are still captured by Judaism and Judaistic ideas, but it's because they were going to church, right? The same reason that you come to church on Sunday mornings, because it's what you do. It's not necessarily the church defines your religion or your beliefs. It's because this is what we, God has mandated for us to do. Does that, y'all, y'all follow me? Y'all tracking with me? So they go to the hour to go to the the church to pray. They enter in by the beautiful gate. And as they go into the beautiful gate, there's this dude here who has been lame since birth. In Acts chapter 4, we get his age. He's roughly mid-40s, late 40 years old. And he's been lame from birth. And, and so we don't really know how long he's been laid here specifically, but we do know he has never walked a day in his life. And more than likely, he has been laid here at the gate for at least the majority of his adult life, if nothing else. So 20 years or so, possibly, that this man's been sat at the main entrance of the temple. And as people came to worship, they would give alms. One of the, the three pillars of Judaism was the Torah, the book of the law, and the commitment to it. Worship, going to the temple to pray, and offer sacrifices, and giving alms. So why not kill two birds with one stone? Where people are automatically going to go, why not set up shop here and make them feel good as they go to church? Y'all know y'all's pocket gets a little loose when you come to church. You know what I'm saying? That's what this man thinks. He thinks, I'm going to make a little bit of money because I'm outside of the church. So every day, his friend sets him here and he asks for alms to be able to make a living. He can't walk. So this is how he provides for himself. Now, uh, Peter and John, it is possible... In their Jewish context, this is not the first time they've been to the temple. You see it? 
Uh, there's nothing in Scripture. This is 100% Daniel, right? This is 100% my thinking and my thought process through this. If they were good Jews, they would go to the temple every day to pray. And John and Peter are probably in their 20s, early 20s, maybe or so, give or take a year or two. More than likely, they've seen this man before. It's possible even that they've even given this man money before because that was one of the pillars that they were called to do, right? It is possible that they've given money before, but there's something different this time. This time, Peter and John see the man. They say, look at us. The man, probably recognizing them, says, okay, I'm about to get paid. But instead, Peter says something that has never been said before by Peter. I don't have any money, but what I do have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise and walk. So what's different this time? What has changed in Peter and John's lives? What, has, what impact has happened for them to be different? Well, if you go back, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, what happens in Acts chapter 2? The Holy Spirit comes. So the Spirit comes, the, the disciples are hanging out, the Spirit comes, tongues happen, these tongues of fire, they start speaking in all these different languages. Everybody around them that are gathered together for the day of Pentecost start freaking out because they hear all their different languages being taught. And then it's like, wait, these are like fishermen and lay people. How can they speak in these tongues? How can, the Spirit has come and God's promises, uh, Jesus' promises of the Helper has happened. What's different? The Holy Spirit. Number one, be aware of the Spirit's leading. Number one, be aware of the Spirit's leading. As they go to the temple, just like they have probably multiple times before, this time there's something different. This time something else has happened in their lives, and now they are aware. They're sober-minded of the spiritual realm. They're sober-minded of what God can and cannot do. Well, that was a bad terminology. God can't not do anything. So y'all just erase that out of your mind that I said that. Anyway, so what God can do, right? Y'all don't... Okay, y'all good. Okay. Phew. Y'all don't, y'all don't tune me out. That man has started preaching something other than the Bible. All right. So, this is reality. I'm going to go through three things really, really quick, and then we'll come back and revisit them. As we live our lives spiritually aware, being spirit-led allows us to see past the surface. Being, spiritually, being spirit-led allows us to see past the surface. Being spirit-led gives us wisdom to be intentional. Being spirit-led gives us wisdom to be intentional. And being spirit-led stretches our faith. Being spirit-led stretches our faith. So, backtrack, right? So they're going to the temple. They see this man. They say, rise, get up, and walk. What's different? Obviously, the Holy Spirit. But if you go back up in Acts chapter 2, when this Holy Spirit comes, this mass awakening. I love the book of Acts. If you want to know what the church is supposed to look like, read the book of Acts. There are thousands of people coming to Christ each day. That happens in Acts chapter 2. There's this huge evangelistic movement after the Holy Spirit comes, and, and thousands of people come to Christ. But here they are, not just doing evangelism, they're also doing relationship. So being Spirit-led allows us to see past the surface. They come to this man. The man doesn't ask to be healed. That man asks for money. You see that? The man says, I, I, I alms, give alms to the poor. I need money. Peter and John see past that need and say, wait, you don't just need money. You need to be able to walk. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. It's a true need versus perception. Think about how we do missions, right? I've been all over the world. And God has taken us all over the world. I've preached all over the world. I've done a lot of different things. And in my young life, uh, when I first started going, uh, one of the first places that I went was the Dominican Republic. Very, very, very third world, poverty-stricken country. So uh, immediately as I get there, the first thing that happens, and it happens to a lot of Americans that go, is they need all of this stuff. They don't have socks, they don't have shoes, they don't have clothes, they don't have food. we got to go get all this stuff. So we bring truckloads of baseballs and bats and bases and clothes and, and gloves and all this stuff, and we dump it, and then we leave. Eventually, those bats are going to break. Eventually, those clothes are going to wear out. Eventually, those clothes are going to break, and those bats are going to be no good. What they need is Jesus, not stuff. 
Now, is that bad? No, that's not bad at all. But what we have done, and this is what I think excites me the most about coronavirus, is that what we have done for decades is we have pushed off relationships and exchanged it for evangelism. And we have said, let me go with all of my stuff. Let me invite you to church. Let me invite you to this D now. Let me invite you to this revival. Let me invite you to this thing. Let me give you this stuff. Let me sign the check so I can deal with your need. But instead, now what we're having to do is we can't do that anymore. We can't give stuff to people because it's got coronavirus. We can't have big functions and stuff like that because everybody's going to get COVID. We can't gather together. We can't do ministry the same anymore, which is now forcing us to see that the need is not physical. The need is spiritual. For so long, we've been kind of passive. For so long, we've said, well, let me just kind of deal with it this way. Let me just deal with it this way and go about it this direction. But no, finally... Finally, we are having to think outside of the box and do ministry relationally. Finally, we are being forced to do that because we can't gather anymore. It's not safe. Being spirit-led allows you to see that there is more to it than just brushing it off and passing the buck. Being spirit-led gives us the wisdom to be intentional and be relational. Jesus is calling us not just to evangelistic approach of the gospel, but he is calling us to a relational, personal, intimate relationship with people. Our problem is, is that we automatically think, what if I offend someone? But you assuming that someone is going to be offended is just as bad as them being offended. I've been talking to my director over the last couple of weeks and just, you know, just talking about all this social unrest and all this racist stuff. And, and you know, I, I want to I learn. I, I'm hungry to understand. I'm hungry to listen. I'm hungry to understand how to navigate the times that we're in. And we've just kind of been open and, and not politically correct really well we haven't we've been having open conversations about race and social injustice and what that looks like and one of the things he said is you know the problem is and it's not your fault but the problem is that we all just assume somebody else's actions are going to happen instead of just jumping off into the situation this is what we've done with the gospel we assume that we're going to be offensive to people. We assume that we're going to be rejected. We assume that we're not going to be able to have personal conversations. We, it's like painful and pulling teeth. It's like, uh, do, I give, get, do, I get my, do I get my track out? Do I hand that to them? Do I give you the Roman road? No, you just do life with people. That's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't have a handful of tracks in his back pocket to hand out. And not that anything's wrong with that. Jesus did life with people. Jesus said, life is hard, and, but let me tell you that I'm the source of true life. Let me tell you, you're going to get hungry, but I can give you something where you'll never hunger again. Let me tell you, you're going to get thirsty and worn slap out in life, but let me tell you where you won't thirst again. Being spirit-led gives you wisdom to be relational. Again, finally, we are having to crack outside of this bubble of, let me invite you to church. Is that bad? No. But what we do is we invite people to church and never talk Jesus to them. So now this preacher that stands up here in the suit and tie is this super ordained person who really knows Jesus. You know how many times I get told by people that I have a direct line with God? So do you. But that's the culture that we've painted. That's what we've done. But now we have to build a relationship with people because that's what Jesus did. It gives us the wisdom to be intentional with people. And being spirit-led stretches our faith. Again, they've, been, they've passed this dude over and over again, but now for this one time, Peter says, you know what? I'm about to step into God's realm. There is no way I can do this on my own. So in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, I'm not saying you go to every lame person and say, rise and walk. If that's what God tells you to do, then you go right ahead. But here's what I am saying. Acts chapter 8. If you go through and you read through the next couple of chapters of Acts, here's what transpires. Acts chapter 6 they, the Hellenistic Jews kind of start murmuring. We talked about it already. So this guy named Stephen gets chosen to be part of the, the ministry team that takes care of the Hellenistic Jews. 
Well, Stephen is very, very vocal about the gospel. He begins to teach and proclaim all of these great things, and it really, really stirs up the religious leaders, just like the religious leaders are about to be stirred up about Peter and John in Acts chapter 4. Long story short, Peter, uh, Stephen says some things that really make some people mad. He ends up losing his life for it by the guy that we know as Paul, a guy named Saul. He orders the execution of Stephen. So then, after that happens, Saul leads this great expedition to persecute the church and and prison all the Christians and prison all the followers of Jesus, do all of that stuff. Now, if you remember Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we've already referenced, what did Jesus say? That you will be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and then to Jerusalem and then to the ends of the world, right? That's what Acts chapter 1, verse 8. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Well, up until Acts chapter 8, up until the end of Acts chapter 7, first of Acts chapter 8, the gospel has been going off like a bomb and bonfire in Jerusalem. Like I'm talking about thousands, like we just talked about, thousands of people, but there has been no active plan to go into the next steps of what God had already, or what Jesus had commanded them. Everybody's been active in Jerusalem at home. Y'all, y'all following me? I feel like I'm running around in bushes in circles, so I, I don't know what's wrong with my head, but anyway. Jerusalem. Thousands of people, but the, nobody said, let's go to Judea. Hey, let's, let's start sending some folks to Samaria. We've got to start executing God's plan for us. So, look what God does. God sends Saul to persecute the church. You don't believe me? Acts chapter 8, verse 1. This is what the Bible says. And Saul approved of his execution, being Stephen. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in where? Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of where? Judea and Samaria. Come on. Y'all tell me God ain't good. Okay. This is my mandate to you. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. You're being comfortable in Jerusalem. Let me raise up Saul to push you into the next phase of my plan. What if? I have been talking, I've already said it, but I've been talking to ministers and friends and just trying to figure out how we navigate this whole chaos. How we navigate, how do we gather, how do we keep people safe, how do we do this, how do we do that, how do we make people feel comfortable again? And in those conversations, it's easily as past, easy for pastors and maybe even for you to get caught up, well, people just ain't coming to church. Well, no, because they're scared to. They're, we're scared to. We're, we're, not, we're uncertain about what's going to happen. It, God called us not to live in fear, but it's still nerve-wracking. It's still nerve-wracking for us to walk into this uncertainty. So what if? What if this was our Acts 8-1 moment? What if COVID was the church's Acts 8-1? What if this whole thing, what if, this is just hypothetical. I don't know if it is or not. But instead of us thinking of it as being this big thing that's taking away our rights and we're doing all this stuff and we can't do this and we can't do that, what if we claim God's sovereignty and said, you know what, God, where are you trying to lead us? Being spirit-led is going to stretch your faith. It is going to make you step into a realm where you don't have control anymore. It is going to force you to step into a realm where you surrender it all and say, Jesus, you've got this thing under control. What if this was COVID for us? I am excited and I am ecstatic that that's the way we've always done it doesn't work anymore. I think I said this before, but please don't ever say that to me. I can't stand that. God is forcing us, maybe, just maybe, to be intimate with broken people again. Being spirit-led is going to lead you to that place that stretches your faith. So what happens next? The man gets up. Everybody realizes this man who's been there his entire life it can walk. Not only is he walking, he's also leaping around, jumping up and down, screaming and hollering. So obviously he's making a scene that he can walk. Why wouldn't he? He's never walked a day in his life. Well, people notice that this is this man, like, begin to wonder what's going on. 
So in verse 11, while he clung to Peter and John, why? Because they can walk now. All of the people utterly astounded round together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or pity we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murder to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given this man this perfect health in the presence of you all. Why do you look at us? We didn't do any of this. Let me tell you who did. This guy who you just crucified, in his name, by faith in his name, this guy named Jesus, that's who did this. Number two, be aware that Jesus is the source. Be aware that Jesus is the source. Now, I want you to go with me here and just entertain me for just a second. Would you agree that we're a capable people? Over time, have our minds and the way we do life evolved? I mean, think about it. We put tons on water and it floats. And we put tons in the air and it flies. It makes no sense. Now, I get in my truck on Sunday mornings and crank my truck up and it pops up on my little thing and says, you are 42 minutes away from Rocky Point Baptist Church. I didn't tell you that's where I'm going, right? Your phones know where you're going now before you do, right? I mean, we're capable people, right? We have done some crazy things. Now, uh, let's just take God out of it for just a second. Just go with me. Just, just hang with me. At first glance, it looks like we have it figured out, doesn't it? The American dream, freedom to be what you want to be, the collection of wealth and being able to know stuff and being able to pick up. If I want to know something, I don't go ask anybody. I pick up my phone and I ask Siri, right? And then I start reading articles on stuff. Like we have this collection of knowledge. We can grow and we can learn and we can be successful and we can make our own way. So at first glance, it looks like we've got it figured out. We can find ways to fight cancer. We can find ways to fly. We can find ways to get across the ocean. We can find ways to drive and get places quicker. We can find ways to cope with Alzheimer's and things like that. We can find all of that stuff. At first glance, the human race has it figured out. Would you agree with that? We look capable. The problem is that, that we're really not. Oh, Job says you give and you take away. God has blessed us with all those things, and I think that's a spiritual truth that we all know. It's very elementary. I think we all know this. And I would, I would even go out on a limb and say, we don't mean to forget this truth. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, we don't, we're not just prideful, puffed up, arrogant people as believers. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that because I don't believe that's true. But what I do believe is that I just think that we're a people that easily forget. Especially in our culture where we can do all of this stuff, all of the distractions. This man now walks again. Everybody runs to Peter and John like they're some miracle worker. Now all of a sudden Peter and John have the floor. They have everyone's attention because of something that had happened. This is the same thing that happens in our lives. All of this stuff outwardly, all of the battles we deal with inwardly, all of the stuff that we walk through on a daily basis can easily distract us and make us very short-term memory loss-minded, if that's even a thing, make us forget what's going on around us and that Jesus really does have this thing figured out. I don't think that we mean to forget. I just think that we do. We have no authority apart from Christ. That's what Peter says. I don't know why y'all think we could do this. It was Jesus that you crucified. We have no purpose apart from Christ. We have no reason to live, no reason to breathe if it's not for Jesus. So the thing that we have to ask ourselves on the daily basis is does everything I do have the kingdom in mind because I can be capable. 
I can do this stuff. I can accumulate all of this stuff. I can do great things. I have talents that I'm good with. I can get up and talk. I can get up and figure things out. I can root cause problem solving. I can drive you nuts by giving you a plan. I can do that. Ask my wife. It drives her crazy. Like, I can do those things. There's things that you can do. Right? There are things that you are good at. There are things that you are blessed with. But when I do those things, is Christ the center of it? Is Christ really working through it? This is the way we have to ask ourselves because for so long it's been on Sunday that's the way I live. On Sunday I get my Jesus. On Sunday I get what I need. On Sunday this is the time I've set aside and then I've kinda, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray throughout the week, but I'm really not going to be intentional gospel live, living all week. I'm not really going to do that because I've got too much other stuff to do that distracts me from that. No, Jesus is calling us to realize that He is the source of life in everything that we do. Think of it as a priority list. How many of us have heard that God is the top of our priority list? Probably everybody in here has heard that, right? It's supposed to be God, then it's supposed to be your marriage, and then it's supposed to be the church, and then it's supposed to be your job, then it's supposed to be whatever, whatever, whatever. It's supposed to be this in descending order of importance, right? You follow me? That is not at all what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that God is the head of your marriage. The Bible teaches that Christ is the head of the church. The Bible teaches is that God is the head of your secular world. The, God, the Bible says that God is the giver of your talents and your passions. It's not that God is the top of your priority list. It is that God is the top priority in your priority list. There's a difference, isn't it? Now, where I just set aside some time, now I'm giving my whole life and investing it in the gospel. Jesus is the source Jesus is where it all comes from. This is healing creates a diving board into the gospel in this story. So what if your story created a diving board into life for someone? Jesus is the source. May we be a people that have lasting impact. I don't want to be known by the stuff that I accumulate. I don't want to be known by how good of a job I can and cannot do. I want to be known by loving my wife as Christ loved the church. I want to be known by loving people that society have written off. I want to be known by making the gospel forefront. Every day my prayer is, God, give me wisdom to lead today. I don't always get that right. I can promise you I don't. But it has changed the way that I live. It has changed the way that I react. It has changed the way that I love my wife. It has changed my entire life by just saying, God, I don't, I, I can't. Jesus is the source. Do not be derailed by everything we have going on. Number three, be aware of the gospel. Number three, be aware of the gospel. Daniel, are you ever going to be quiet about the gospel? Like every week we've been in True North, you've said something about the gospel. Y'all remember when you was in school how you learned? You kept on talking about it. You just did your ABCs on day one, then you had it figured out, didn't you? You did one plus one equals two on day two, and you had that figured out, didn't you? Right? We learn by repetition. And the Bible clearly lays this out. Let's just continue reading the rest of the story, and then we'll wrap it on up. Verse 17. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as also did your rulers. He's talking in reference to what we just read, that you handed Jesus over to Pilate. You crucified him, but you know what? You acted as everyone else did. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Everything that happened to Jesus, the Old Testament prophesied. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the, the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time of restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him and whatever he tells you, and it shall be every soul that who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people." And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days. You are the sons of the prophet and of the covenant that God made with your father, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Deep breath. 
What did Peter just say? Peter just told them that you handed Jesus over. That makes you worse than Pilate. Peter just said, you traded Jesus for a murderer and you killed the man who gives you life. You killed the author of life, is what Peter says. He says, you're ignorant and you don't understand the Bible because the Old Testament prophesied this is going to happen to Jesus. He says, you denied your privilege as God's chosen people. He said, you're flat out wicked. This is what he says to the rulers. But then watch what happens in verse 26. To bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. You murdered Jesus, but let me tell you, his love is still enough for you. Isn't that our story? I wasn't there. You know that song, Were You There When You Crucified My Lord? None of us were. But the picture is that my sin is what tacked him to the cross. The picture is, is that my sin, some 2,000 years later, my life of shame and my life of failure was there as they crucified my Lord. And in that moment, Jesus said, Daniel, I love you, and you're going to be a failure, but let me give you life and make you a success. Let me give you purpose some 2,000 years ago, and that's going to be enough. You have betrayed me. You stabbed me in the back. You said you didn't want any part of me. You said you hate me, but I'm going to love you and give you redemption. This is what Peter just said. You are the people who gave the command to kill Jesus. You are the people when asked if you want Barabbas or Jesus, you chose the murderer Barabbas and said you keep Jesus and crucify him. That's you. But don't you worry, he doesn't hold a grudge. He did all that so he can offer you repentance. He did all that so he can offer you salvation. We tend to have the outlook of defeat on life. Don't we? As we look at all of this stuff, nothing is going to change. Not even the virus world, right? In the political world, we act like a, whoever's in the presidential office is going to determine how good our lives are. There are some things that happen there, but we get way too political in church. We, we think that has, that's going to control us. Or we think that maybe one day if I can make a little bit more money, then, then I can have joy. Or maybe I can live through my kids and my kids can be successful and I can, have, I can be my kids' best friend and, and they're going to be great and, and, they're going to be, and that's going to give me joy. Or maybe I need to do this and maybe I'll do that and, and at the end of the day we're left depressed. Or, or then we know someone who's just a broken up wreck and it's like, man, they're, they're just never going to find hope. They're always going to be addicted. They're always going to be rejected. They're never going to make a way for themselves. Peter just flat out told the people who murdered Jesus, here's salvation. You cannot tell me that Jesus can't make a way. You cannot tell me that lives don't change when they come in contact with Jesus. Scripture completely tells a different narrative. So may I challenge you to quit living your life if that is truth. That God has no impact. That Jesus really can't turn things around that God isn't sovereign, because we don't believe that. But I think if we're honest, sometimes our lives reflect that. And we are just beat up, depressed, walking around with our lip poked out because everything didn't go our way. And we're worried about all of this stuff. But Jesus says, no, this is the gospel. The gospel is, I came to save that which was lost. What does that mean? I came to go get dirty. Everybody, all the religious leaders were shook up because Jesus didn't want to spend any time with them. Jesus said, you already got it figured out. I came for those that are broken. I came for those who need a way. I came for those who need life. I came for those that are hungry. I came for those that are thirsty. Jesus can change lives. Jesus can do what God has been doing since Genesis chapter 1. 
Nothing has changed with our God. Be aware of the good news of Jesus. That as you go out tomorrow, as you leave this place today, I wonder what our lives would look like if we were aware of the spirit that lived inside of us. I wonder if we listened more and talked less. I wonder what it would look like if we walked our lives sober and aware. I, if you get to know me or you talk to anybody that knows me, you're going to realize that I'm a very busy individual. And anytime I'm not busy, I want to be busy. Like if I'm at the house, I'm working on something. If you talk to people that know me, that's how I am. And in the busyness, right, that's how our lives are. God's still God. And don't get distracted by all the stuff that he can't be God in the stuff. That he can't be sovereign over the stuff. That he can't sustain in all the stuff you have going on. If you go out into this world, as you go and you do whatever you're going to do today and tomorrow, be aware that God is working in and through you for His good. If you don't know who Jesus is and you're watching us online or you're hanging out in here with us, can I just say to you that there is a God who loves you. There is a Jesus who sacrificed everything for you. And He said, you know what? If we're going to look in terms that, like, we, we know sin is sin, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But if we're going to rank sin like we tend to do, you can't get any worse who put the knife in Jesus' back. And Jesus says there's a way for them, therefore there's a way for you. Come on. We have to be sobered up, especially now, because the way we do ministry is changing. The way we do church is changing, whether we like it or not, whether we're comfortable with it or not. It's got to change. I don't know what that change is. I don't know what that looks like. If I, if I did, I'd tell you. I promise I would, but I don't know. And I think that's what's so fun is nobody knows. But we know who's in control. Jesus is the source. So as we close today, can I ask you this? Can I ask you as we pray and we get ready to respond, can I ask you to just be honest with God? A lot of times you may see me pray like this. And in those moments, what I'm doing is I'm saying in my head, in the picture I'm painting in my head is, God, this is all of my junk. This is all of my worry. This is all of my fear. This is all of me. God, I'm giving that to you. Now, God, I'm asking in return that you give me all of you. That you give me all of your presence. That you give me all of your wisdom. That you give me you. So I wonder if that's the response that we can have today. It's a dangerous prayer to pray. But if we're going to be a people that are spirit-led, we're going to have to be a people that are sobered up. If we're going to be a people that walk the same path, we're going to have to be sobered up, and we're going to have to be spiritually aware. And we're going to have to say, God, here's all of my opinions. Here's all of my fear. Here's all of my anxiety. Here's all of me, God. And I'm trusting that you're going to be enough. God, help me receive you. God, we believe. But Lord, help us in our unbelief. It's okay to pray that. So can we respond today just like that? God, you are so good. And God, it's hard to focus on you in a world full of distractions. God, it's easy to miss you. And God, I pray that you'd forgive us of that. God, we don't mean to. We, we don't, God. But God, I pray you would sober us up. That you would make us aware that you are working for our good. You are working for the betterment of the kingdom. That there is no place that your light will not reach. There is nothing too broken for you to fix. That God, you are leading us to be intentional and relational with your gospel. God, what would it look like 
God, just give us a picture. Give us a glimpse of what it will look like if your people were led by your Spirit. God, I pray that you'd forgive me of where, where I'm selfish. And God, I want to write my own story. I pray that you'd forgive me of that. God, in this moment, may we be headstrong to true north, the gospel. God, as we respond, may you be exalted. And it's in your name we pray.